All right, so um, I'm going to talk uh, like 20 minutes on return to play because it's a uh, it's a really topic of, of mine that I that I really enjoy um, and um, there's a little bit of a twist to it and it's really case based so hopefully you'll kind of get a little bit of a flavor of how I got interested in concussion. Um, so again, I mean, I think we all know that injury and illness is common and, and return to play is um, decisions that are, are made based on a variety of frameworks and, and criteria. And I, uh, in talking to, to some of you tonight, I, I understand that you do a lot of that, right? You make a lot of those decisions uh, working with your athletes and your teams. And, and certainly understanding the science is critical, right? You have to understand the nature of the injury and, the, and, the, and or the illness uh, the factors that are specific to the athlete as well as the the sport in terms of making those decisions um, but i think it's important that we think about other factors uh, and that really what's is what really is the the art of medicine as opposed to um, just the science so um, you know when i first started my career it was at penn state university which is a pretty big sporting school uh, in the United States, and one of the uh, first athletes that I had, my, I happened to, to date, I'm now married to the baseball coach, um, but um, one of the issues that we had was an athlete that had um, bloody diarrhea. And so we ended up working him up and he was diagnosed with uh, Crohn's colitis. And um, the, the physician basically said to me, the, the gastroenterologist said, well, he can't play. It's obvious he can't play. And I go, well, wait a minute, why? I mean, we've controlled, he's not bleeding anymore. He's hemodynamically stable and, and he's a pitcher. And he said, well, you know, they got to run, they got to do this, they got to do that. And I said, well, we're, we're the, I'm the team doctor. I can, we can basically limit what he does activity wise and he should be able to play. And it really is, um, I mean, I think that decision in terms of when, when is it safe, uh, when is it not safe, uh, I'm a, again, we always think about the evidence um, and we want to have a, a shared decision as we, as we are working with our athletes. But, you know, who makes that decision? Who is it up to? Is it the specialist? Is it the, the GP? Um, is it the physio? Uh, and then what are the rules and policies that might be in place? And it's really when my interest in, um, in primary care sports medicine was, was sort of fueled because you're always asking the question, What's the effect of the exercise on, on disease? Like, what's the effect of exercise on someone that's got Crohn's? Uh, and then vice versa. What's the effect of the disease uh, in terms of its, its role with someone that participates in exercise? So that's really how I kind of got interested in this whole return to play. And um, when I was uh, a resident, um, I interacted with uh, Tim Quill. And I'm not sure if, if anybody uh, here in knows of Tim Quill, but Tim Quill ended up writing this um, this sounding board article called Death and Dignity, um, and he ended up uh, basically um, prescribing bar barbiturates to a patient who had um, uh, cancer and didn't want to be treated. So, you know, he literally saw her for a rash and fatigue, ended up getting uh, blood work, uh, and it was um, it was it was significant. Her white her white cell count was was 4.3. Her hematocrit was uh, 22, and so he ended up calling her and explaining things. And you know, she said, "Well, wait a minute, don't don't tell me it could be cancer." And he thought, "Well, I, I wish I didn't have to, but that's his role as a doctor, right?" So. And long story short, and she ended up having um, uh, uh, a blood cancer, and it would, would be treated. It could be treated. But she decided that she didn't want treatment. Uh, and so even though as hard as that was for, for him to sort of go through the science and say, well, wait a minute, you know, 25% of the time it's, it's successful and you can have a long-term cure. And she said, I, I don't want treatment. Uh, she then came back in and wanted to talk to him about um, getting um, barbiturates for sleep, but he knew well that she really wanted to sort of end her life the way that she wanted to end her life. So long story short, uh, or not so short, um, he ended up meeting with her. He had her get a second opinion and um, subsequently did prescribe uh, her barbiturates knowing that she was, gonna, when the time was right, she was going to take, take her own life. And he ended up having to go, uh, go to go to court and fight uh, and fight for the, the right to be able to do that. Um, but what why this ties into me is that literally um, 
he brought her into our, our resident rounds and, and spoke to, had her come in and actually talk about, you know, how important it is for, for patients to be able to have a say in their treatment. Um, and again, as a young resident, I was, you know, most of us were like, wait a minute, you should, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you be treated? You have a 25% chance of being cured. Uh, but it was really an important lesson for me in terms of the importance of having, uh, being an advocate for your patients and, and trying to figure out um, how, to, how, to make it, how to make it work for them. Um, so my second and third cases, and this is part of the reason I ended up being interested in concussion. Um, one was uh, probably really early in my career, a basketball player turned and she got elbowed in the temple and was knocked unconscious. Uh, by the time I got out onto the court, one pupil's big, one pupil's small. Uh, she was unconscious. She came to and she said, my, my head really hurts. And she couldn't move her left upper extremity and she was weak in her left flexor, hip flexor. Uh, we ended up um, boarding her, brought her to the hospital, CAT scans normal of her, of her brain and her, and her neck. MRI scan next day, normal of her brain and her, and her neck. Her weakness resolved after a few hours. At the time, the guidelines were you kept somebody out for a month. So she was out for a month and then came back to play. And when she came back to play, she got hit again and had ringing in her ears. Um, and um, she was having trouble with, uh, with naming things. So she'd say, you know, like we had chalk. So <laughs> I know I'm dating myself, right? <laughs> chalk at the chalkboard. And she'd go up and she'd pick it up with the opposite hand. Uh, and she would have trouble naming things like it's, it's, uh, it's not a pencil, but it's something else that you write with and she couldn't come up with pen. So I ended up sending her to a neuropsychologist and they did a bunch of tests and um, turned out that she um, ended up having some deficits that we weren't sure whether they were baseline or not. And so we actually started our program at, at, at Penn State University at that time looking at neuropsychological testing, which are you know, very comprehensive tests that look at brain behavior um, relationships. Um, but one of the things that I, I asked her at one point was, how do you feel about, you know, returning to play? And she's like, well, <laughs> to be honest, I'm scared. She said, like, every time I, I, I try to, you know, every time I go back and, and play basketball, I lose something. I get hurt and then I lose something. And I'm afraid I'm not going to get it back. And so the lesson that, that that taught me outside of all that I've learned about neuropsychology was um, how important it is to ask your patients how they feel about, you know, are they apprehensive and are they, you know, how are they feeling about returning to sport? And I think it's one of the things that, you know, stuck with me. The other uh, basketball player that I took care of, which is, um, which, which was a challenge, was uh, a player who had had a subdural when he was eight years old. He got hit in the head with a baseball bat. It had blood, they had drained it uh, surgically. And then he ended up you know, having no issues through uh, the rest of elementary school and, and high school and played sports. And so we had to make the decision, is it okay for him to play at university at a, a scholarship level? And we ended up saying uh, yes. And then he ended up having a, a concussion uh, his first year where he felt, um, couldn't remember the, the, where we had played and, and the, had difficulty with memory. So he, sta he spent the entire year at the end of the bench sitting next to me. And my name's Patukian. Uh, Kevorkian was in the news. I don't know if you remember. Kevorkian was the guy that was assisting, helping to assist uh, people commit suicide. And so uh, he used to call me Kevork. He was like, hey, Kevork. So he gets hurt again, and literally um, I show up at the hospital, and he doesn't know who I am. And he doesn't know who his teammates are. And, um, you know, everything's otherwise okay. Uh, I call his parents, and they say, well, should we, should we send him, you know, should we, come should we come from Tulsa? And I'm like, no, just, let's just see how he does the next day. The next day walk in, he still doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know his teammates, he doesn't know he's in college, he doesn't know uh, that he went on a blind date um, a couple nights before. Uh, and this persisted for six days. I'd never seen anything quite like it, and that's really part of the reason I ended up interested in, in, uh, in concussion. So, um, you know, 
your role as a, as a team doctor, this is sort of what the team physician consensus statement uh, first said, you know, the process of deciding when an athlete is ready. Uh, and they should be familiar with this process. Um, they should be able to evaluate the athlete. Um, they should be able to be familiar with treatment and rehabilitation. And then finally make that decision as it relates to return to play. Um, shortly thereafter, the Canadians uh, looked at what, what the team physician consensus statement had come up with and came up with this model that many of you may have seen previously it's by Creighton. And it's um, a three-step process of return to play, taking into account medical factors, sport factors, and then decision modifiers. Um, we updated our, the team physician consensus statement in 2012. And at that point, we took a lot of the issues that were, were brought up in that start um, uh, process and, um, again, looked at uh, the, the major issues in terms of making return to play decisions. Um, and we added some areas where it was, you know, a little bit less, less spelt out. Um, and that was primarily the psychological readiness piece. And so that was really taken into account that there are a lot of emotional reactions that occur when an athlete is injured uh, and that we have to take into account um, their fear of being injured again. Um, we have to sort of uh, account for the fact that they may feel quite isolated um, and then also their autonomy. So, you know, certainly the pressures that athletes may feel in terms of returning too quickly. Um, shortly thereafter, the START framework was published, and again, this is very similar to the, that Creighton model, um, where again, you're taking uh, an assessment of health and activity, um, comparing um, the, the, the risk, um, as well as taking into account what the athlete's risk tolerance is. You know, what are they willing, what risks are they willing to take? Um, and, and again, this is a framework that I think may, may be familiar to, to many folks because it's been well-established in the literature. Uh, Claire Ardern um, asked uh, uh, critical questions as it relates to return to play and you know, kind of looking at the combination or the overlap between, again, the evidence, uh, the physician, and then the athlete uh, and trying to sort out what, what makes sense. Uh, and the five questions you know, is how does the clinician determine when an athlete's ready? You know, integrate the best evidence with the, the preferences of the patient. Um, you try to use some kind of a, a clinical criteria, but understand that there's a huge gap a lot of times in a lot of areas for a lot of areas uh, for a lot of injuries. Um, so there's a huge knowledge gap in terms of what we really know about the science. Um, you know, is physical recovery uh, uh, alone enough? And again, that's the whole piece of psychological readiness. And how do we define successful return to play? Is it how the, the surgeon defines it or is it how the athlete defines it? And, and um, I think that's an important question. And then also, uh, what are the responsibilities of our, of our physicians and our, uh, the other folks making these decisions? Is, it, are, is the patient the, the number one responsibility or do you have a responsibility to, to the university uh, that, you, that you may work for, the team that you, may, that you may work for? And then finally, should the athlete even return to play and being able to balance uh, the autonomy of the athlete who says, I'm fine, I want to play with, uh, with what we feel is good practice or safe for the athlete. Um, we have to remember that there are conflicts of interest, right? Physicians a lot of times have a legal liability. Uh, for, for Major League Soccer, for, for example, you know, our, our physicians are the ones that have the legal liability. Our athletic trainers, which are very similar to the physios here, uh, work under the plan of care of a, of, of a physician. So if something goes wrong, it's all on the, all on the physician's you know, legal liability. Um, and you, know, you certainly want to protect uh, the, the, the patient. That's the number one, number one issue. Uh, but again, if you're employed by um, a university or a club, then a lot of times you also have a responsibility to mitigate risk for, for that, for that uh, institution. And then finally, you know, there are some situations where there may be rules that you have to comply with in order to, you know, if someone has a concussion in, in rugby, there, you know, there's a, a certain period of time that they have to stand down. Uh, and so there may be guidelines that you have to follow in that regard. Um, you know, at least in the United States, and I, I imagine uh, everywhere in the world now, we're really looking at uh, all different ways to, to monitor performance 
and athlete monitoring. And uh, this article from Tim Gabbett is really fantastic because it's, it just, it dummies it down for someone like me to be able to understand all that goes on as it relates to, to monitoring. Uh, and this model is really one of the ones that, uh, that I think he presented that is uh, an excellent framework that again looks at sort of, you know, what's the athlete's response to a load and then how do we uh, respond to that? How, did the, how does the athlete cope? Uh, and then how does that, you know, kind of circle back as it relates to workload? The other thing that, that's come um, full, you know, full force is uh, wearable technology and the analytics that go with it. And we're seeing this all over the place and it's certainly an opportunity for uh, clinicians and engineers and data scientists to be able to work together and collaborate. Um, the, this article talked about sort of the, the six different thrusts towards being able to reduce the, the burden of injury. Um, and again, uh, it's important that we're getting accurate data and being able to, um, you know, apply that for athlete safety and performance. And a lot of times we're looking at, I was with our, with our women's team and um, we were talking to the data scientists about an athlete's uh, data. And we're like, I don't know if we can, can trust it. There's no way. There's no way she's running, running that fast. Right? So you have to be able to be able to interpret it and make sure that it's accurate. So there's, there, there are these four sort of models that are out there as it, as it relates to return to play. The, the start model that I, that I started off with. Um, and then Claire Ardern has done uh, a fair bit as it relates to um, return to sport for uh, sports physical therapy um, and also the psychological response to injury. Uh, and then finally the, the Gabbett uh, workload framework. Um, there are other approaches to uh, sports injuries, and again, this is something that I think many of us in the room probably deal with when you're talking about, let's say, ACL injury. And if you're thinking about all the different risk factors for, um, for athletes, their age, um, what, they, what sport, their load, um, it may be different for an athlete that's a, you know, a field hockey player versus someone that's a, a gymnast, right? So those different, they have different uh, weights as it relates to how much of a risk factor it might be for that particular athlete. So it's, it's being able to take that into effect as well. And, um, you know, medicine really is a science, right? A science of uncertainty and an art of probability. So uh, this is a, a case that, you know, I'm going to preface this by saying that this happened in 2005. So it was way early in my Princeton career, and it was a water polo athlete that had dizziness. Um, had, he had had a history of uh, syncope four years prior, and he'd had a workup at that time. He was in high school in Hawaii, uh, and he'd had an, a, a pretty decent workup at that time. His, his uh, uh, neighbor was a cardiologist, and he spoke to him and just said this is what was going on, and his cardiologist th thought, maybe you're just out of shape, and he just had that workup not that long ago, um, and didn't think much of it. Um, he then comes to... Um, he, he, has, uh, he comes to Princeton and he literally has a, an episode where he feels like he's going to pass out, gets out of the pool, proceeds to pass out. So then he comes to our, our, um, the, the health center and we repeat his evaluation. So we do a, an electrocardiogram, we do a, a lab, some labs, uh, we do an echocardiogram and they're all normal. Uh, we, the cardiologist um, wanted to get a tilt test, which, you know, markedly reproduced his symptoms. Um, so I, I guess the question would be, are we done? Would you guys clear him? Is he, go, is he ready to go back in the pool? Anybody say, yeah, good, good to go, good workup? <laughs> Anybody want something else? All right. Well, we ended up getting a stress test. So his electrocardiogram is normal. It's got normal intervals. Um, his rhythm strip is normal. Um, and he does a stress test. And the cardiologist calls me and says, you know, this is one of your typical Princeton athletes. He, he made it all the way through. And it was only in, in recovery that he started having some issues. Um, so he has a couple runs of, you see a couple episodes here of VT. Right? Two, two, two beats, three beats, then he has this. So he has, you know, 
eight, 10 beats of ventricular tachycardia, wide space um, rhythm abnormality. So we, at that point, disqualify him from sport. We end up getting a, um, a cardiac MRI, which was, at least in the United States, very novel. You don't, we don't, it was brand new to get cardiac MRI. Uh, it was felt to be normal. He had an electrophysiology study um, and, again, had no pre-excitation. He didn't have any abnormalities on that. Uh, the, then proceeded the cardiologist pl put in a, an implantable loop monitor, a recorder, to sort of monitor his heart rate. And over time, he was doing fine. He had no symptoms. Uh, so at, at the two-month mark, they uh, said that he could get back in the pool and just start to swim. But he's having no episodes, nothing. No dizziness, nothing. And then when they download what the loop recorder was measuring, and it was, it was, it was normal, no, no ab abnormalities. Finally, at six months, he was cleared to return to full play. And he came back in for his uh, follow-up physical, which is a year later now, in August. And he had no issues at all with preseason, but then pre-preseason, uh, but then in preseason got a little bit dizzy. So pre-preseason isn't a typo. We have at, at Princeton, you sort of, the athletes get together before they show up on campus because they're only allowed to come to campus, you know, late. So they get together on their own. And during pre preseason he was fine. But then when he showed up on campus, he started getting dizzy again. And I said, well, when, <laughs> when's the next time you're going to download your monitor? And he said, well, it's, it's like in a week or so. I said, you know, let's do it now. Let's, let's, let's move that up. So um, this is from one of his episodes of being dizzy. Um, not good, right? Even the surgeons in the room probably can go, this is not good. And uh, same thing. So he had monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is not, not a good rhythm, not a good rhythm. Uh, and it literally started, here's where it starts, and there's where it ends. So um, he actually had a defibrillator placed. And um, before it was placed, they repeated the cardiac MRI. And there was a suggestion that there might be a little bit of um, uh, inflammation and felt to be a myocarditis. So that was his uh, final diagnosis. And um, we, dis we disqualified him from sport. He was a senior. Um, and at the time, the guidelines for cardiology, the cardiologists, would say that you, know, you shouldn't have a defibrillator and play competitive you know, elite sport. So that was part of the reason that we disqualified him. Um, and uh, again, that, that, uh, that might be different if we were seeing him now, and we'll talk about that. So um, again, I think this is an article that Dr. Bagish wrote related to shared decision making in, in terms of cardiovascular disease. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's phenomenal because it talks a little bit about uh, the previous guidelines related to um, cardiovascular conditions, you know, and uh, for, the most, for the most part, um, whenever you had anything that would be potentially life-threatening, um, there was a 0% chance of allowing an athlete back into play. Um, I, and now, to play cricket, though, Margo. What's that? Cricket was 1A. So. 1A. That's right. Unless you, that, that's true. That's, mm. that's some of the sports that you golf and cricket. Cricket's 1A. Was. Wow. So we went to the cricket in Adelaide. So cricket is probably not all cricket is 1A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's but it's, it's a pretty high exertion. I'm surprised. Yeah. Because I mean, the other sports are golf <coughs> and bowling. Probably wasn't. <laughs> yeah. That's 10 pin bowling, right? Yeah, yeah 10 pin bowling. Yeah. No, you're not bowling. Lawn bowling. Yeah. bowling. Yeah. We'll take your lawn bowling so you can see what that's like. <laughs> so now there are the newer guidelines um, are the ones on the bottom here. And um, all of the recommendations in the uh, AHA, American Heart Association, and, and ACC are level of evidence C. So they're really a expert consensus um, in the absence of any kind of randomized controlled trials. 30% um, are class two where participation in sports either reasonable or can be considered. So it's changed from zero to now 30%. Um, and um, that's because either the adverse effects are, are, aren't, aren't common uh, or now there's management that can be specific that can actually allow athletes to return to play. Um, and this is sort of the, 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 the algorithm that uh, Dr. Bagish puts in this article, which is 
really important as it relates to talking with patients, going through and risk stratifying and kind of going through all those necessary steps. It takes a lot of work. Um, and there's been a lot of work, I think, in the, in the, in the realm of cardiology for a lot of different spe you know, specific conditions, right? Especially some of the genetic heart conditions and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, as well as the role of defibrillators. And is it safe to have an athlete play with a defibrillator? Um, we know now more than we did certainly back in 2005. Um, so uh, I think it's also important to consider the denominator, right? Like when, when you think about all the athletes that have these conditions that have been participating and they've never had any issues whatsoever. Um, so that's important. And then there, there are still a lot of significant knowledge gaps. Uh, this was an article that Dr. Dresner, um, and, and he sort of did the same thing in terms of looking at a spectrum of return to play for athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and his point is really, there's still gonna be a line in the sand, but maybe it's moving. Maybe you can move it and be a little bit more flexible uh, in certain situations when you risk stratify the athlete that's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you know, by age, by wall thickness, um, by whether they've had any kind of arrhythmias, et cetera. So, there's a way to look at a, a particular athlete and then risk stratify, and that pro provides you with very athlete-specific information that you can then um, have a decision with, with the, the athlete and their family. Princeton scores a touchdown, they win. A field goal, we go to a third overtime. If they get stopped, Lafayette wins. Robert's got the carry against, looking to slip his way through. It's a hard hit. He took a shot. Jordan Colbert will break the line. Touchdown! Touchdown! touchdown. Jordan Colbert snaps for the point. Number one, Cornell Princeton, Jordan Holgerth, outside, nice blocks, nice moves. Wow, he's quick, isn't he? He had something inside of him that didn't allow him to be tackled. Suddenly they're faced with a very serious disease that can kill them. I wouldn't be playing at all and my career is over doing all this testing and it's something with the blood. There's no cure. There's no cure. So I'm going to move on just for the sake of time, but this is an athlete who uh, was a walk-on. So he came to the university, did not have a scholarship, and, and then by the time he was a senior, he was a captain. Uh, he was working in New York and um, for like investment banking, and he was getting up at four in the morning to do his workouts because he's a captain. Um, in the summertime with, with work um, and then um, basically came into camp in the, in the fall and uh, I saw him for a hamstring injury. And he was a kid that would walk into the room and light, light up, the, he had this huge smile that would light up the, light up the room. And he, and he came in and he wasn't smiling. And I'm like, hey, Jordan, are you all right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, so, you know, I, I called the athletic trainer and I said, Charlie, I don't know what's up, but something's wrong with, something's not right with Jordan. Two weeks later, we end up um, playing, a, playing in a match um, and he sprains his ankle. And it's bad enough that he can't continue. So at, at halftime, he's pulled uh, and at halftime, I, I talked to him a little bit and I said, you know, Jordan, what is going on? And he's like, well, I'm... I've been tired, um, I'm a bit dizzy, um, I'm, I, I get tired going up a flight of steps, um, brush my teeth and my, my, my gums are bleeding. Um, so I said, well, we'll get blood work, you know, two days, we'll get blood work. And I thought it was probably the anti-inflammatories that I put him on that <laughs> made him anemic or something like that. Um, but he ended up having panic values, whereas his uh, hemoglobin was um, eight, his platelet count was 15,000, and his white blood cell count was less than 0.8. Um, and so they were panic values. Um, I ended up calling him into my office, and I said, I think, you know, I want you to get a teammate to drive you up to the hospital, and you're going to go to the, the, the clinic there and be admitted. Um, and they were confirmed. He ended up having a bone marrow biopsy. He had aplastic anemia, so his bone marrow was just empty. There, was no, there were no cells there. Uh, and the underlying etiology was uh, something that I'd only learned about in med school and never <laughs> remembered, uh, but parax paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which can cause aplastic anemia. 
Um, he was treated with blood and platelet transfusions. He was stabilized. He went back to Virginia, where he's from. He was en enrolled in a clinical trial uh, that the uh, National Institute of Health had. Um, and he start was started on a medication that's called Solaris, uh, which is an IV infusion. Um, and he was getting that every two weeks. Um, he, uh, at six months, um, responded to this treatment. And he was actually cleared. He was back home, but he was cleared to return to light activity. And not very, not very long afterwards, he started saying, hey, doc, am I gonna, can, I, can, I come play, can I come back and play football? And you know, I'm certainly not the expert there, right? So I start having con conversations with his hematologist and our hematologist oncologist and said, you know, is this even a, can we even think about letting this guy come back? and playing football, and what would be the level? Well, how, high, how high does this hematocrit have to be before he can play? How high does his white, you know, white count need to be? And he was continuing to get uh, the, the Solaris infusion, and he ended up getting it in our health center. Um, and we have a clinic, and it's like, I think $12,000 for an infusion. Um, and so it was a big decision in terms of whether we're really gonna be able to, to do this. Um, and so, uh, but we did, we documented the, the risk. We had the discussion with him that he was gonna have to have weekly blood tests and that he was gonna have to um, really, you know, be, be on top of any symptoms that he might develop and, and really have a responsibility to report any symptoms. Uh, and he returned to play his uh, senior, senior season, which was, which was pretty cool. Uh, this one, I won't play the video, but uh, another American football player was seen on the sideline for a headache. The way that my, my clinic at Princeton would work is I'd see patients and then I would go out onto the, onto the American football field and finish up with, with practice because there'd inevitably be two, three, four, four guys that they would ask me to see. Um, so I'd, I ended up going out to clinic or out of clinic early that day and was, was early part of practice. And one of the players uh, said, hey, doc, you gotta check out Kamal. So Kamal, it was early in practice, and he sat down on the, the back of our little truck. And um, I said, what's going on? He's like, I, I just got a headache. So I started going through our, you know, our scat, right, the Maddox questions. You know, do you know where you are? Who we play last week? Uh, did we win? You know, and uh, he, he wasn't getting it. They were, they were all wrong. You know, they, he was, we're in the wrong month. And I'm like, okay. So I start going through the rest of my exam, and he stands up, and he goes, I need air, like, okay. So uh, I just sort of said, all right, I, we're, we're gonna go now. I, like, I'm gonna, you know, you're gonna go to the hospital. So uh, we call public safety um, and then we bring him off the field and we're waiting for public safety and he says, I don't feel good. And he started vomiting. And I said, forget public safety, call, it, call an ambulance. Uh, ambulance gets there and um, he's a little bit lethargic and I said, you know, I don't think I'm gonna have you go to the hospital hospital. I think I want you to go to the trauma center. So like five minutes further, but they have, uh, you know, there's someone, there's someone there, there's a, there's a neurosurgeon there. And um, he ended up having a, uh, an AVM that bled and um, ended up having a emergency surgery to drain, to drain the blood. Uh, and it was probably, you know, it was an AVM. So it was, it was something that could have just happened when he was, sleeping or walking around campus and just serendipitously it happened at practice. Um, so that was his story and they ended up, um, the surgeon ended up deciding that um, the best option for this based on where this was, was to have a craniotomy and um, remove the AVM and so surgically resect it. Um, and he left school, went back uh, home to Atlanta um, and then followed up with us and pretty quickly, I mean, he, from the, from the moment he was in the hospital, he said, I'm playing football again. And I'm like, uh, we're not talking about that anytime soon. Um, but literally, uh, he wanted to return to play football. Um, he had a repeat um, MR angiogram a year later that was completely normal. Um, there was no evidence for an AVM. And he was seen by the surgeon that operated on him at Princeton. He was seen by uh, the co-chair of the National Football League's Head, Neck, and Spine Committee, who is a vascular specialist. And they both agreed that since the problem had been corrected and he'd been out a year and his craniotomy had healed, that he could return to play football. 
Um, and so, um, again, he, we had a meeting with the athlete, with the parents, with the surgeon, uh, in terms of what, what, the, what he had gone through and what, what the risks were. So I haven't always said yes. I already gave you the case scenario of that, the athlete that had a subdural. Um, you know, we did not feel comfortable allowing him back. Um, we basically said that, the, you know, having six days of memory loss after a very subtle uh, blow um, was not consistent with us feeling comfortable for him. Um, I've also had an athlete that was another American football player that in, uh, in, in high school had an unexplained splenic infarct. Um, and then at the end of, we, we, we cleared him after reviewing all the records that he had, had done um, around that high school injury. Um, and then he played his freshman year for us and was a star, was the uh, all, all Ivy um, player and then was studying for exams and had a stroke. Um, so he was life flighted down to uh, where, where Dr. Masters from and had treatment there, but he had um, significant persistent abnormalities and despite the fact that he wanted to come back, we didn't let him. And then we've had another, I've had another athlete with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I have to admit, like uh, when I, throughout my, my career, I've always been, you know, do they have a condition, very binary in, the, in my thinking. If they have it, okay, they're done. You know, if it's cardio, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they're done. Um, and uh, I think that it's interesting when you think, start to think about making binary decisions, whether that's the way to go. You know, binary decisions really probably aren't for humans. Um, and I think it's important to try to look at, this is actually an article that has nothing to do with medicine. Um, and, but it's a way of looking at problems and trying to uh, really deconstruct them and think differently about, about problems as you, as you come up with them. Um, return to play has been something that's been discussed at, you know, for a lot of you know, different, you know, different situations. Um, who makes the call, uh, you know, shared decision making, I think, is, is an area that we're just starting to um, see the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what about coaches and the communication as it relates to that? Um, and um, how does that, how, how does that re relate to the uh, athlete's ability to return to play as well? So there's a lot of different work that's been written about return to play. And, um, you know, I think for, for me, I, it's a, a lot of uh, stakeholders and, and it's really a collaborative team. Uh, and there are some that don't feel like there are areas here that a doctor should be involved in, right? There's, you know, I've been talking with, with Mark related to some of the issues that come up for us in, in football in the United States is we have strength and conditioning folks and performance people that feel like, you know, well, doc doctors don't care about performance. They don't, they're just taking care of injuries. They're just taking care of illness. It's like, no, there's a lot of, a lot of the docs that really do think that, you know, load and, being able to be preventive, you know, pre preventing in injuries and illnesses is, is really an, an important piece. So I think, uh, I think it's important that we can really work in terms of collaborating. And uh, again, for uh, athlete-centered care, when we're making these decisions, it's presenting the science and what we know as well as what we don't know. A lot of times we're good at telling a patient what we think, but not necessarily what, what really is the evidence that we have. Um, summarize their, their risk profile, discuss the options, and then take into account what their preferences might be. Um, and um, I think it's also important to really start thinking about those questions. You know, like what is the risk for someone that's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? You know, does it differ if they're 14 versus, th versus, versus in their 30s? What about, you know, rupture of the spleen and, and infectious mononucleosis? How, how common does that happen? When I was first, you know, in my training, I remember being told that if someone, if you have an athlete that has a single kidney, they shouldn't play contact sports. They shouldn't play American football or, or rugby, right? But what's the real risk of uh, having an injury in rugby where you're gonna lose your kidney, right? So you sort of have to think critically, critically of this. And uh, this is an old, old video, but you see non-contact collapse Right? It wasn't like there was no mechanism of, of injury. It's not a concussion. And look at his feet. Everyone just see everyone see his feet jump. So this is a player that's got a defibrillator. It works. 
<laughs> so, you know, and I think we know that exercise is good, right? There's so many situations, concussion, cardiovascular risk, mental health. We know that exercise is good. And so, again, there are situations where we can, we can make a difference. So um, it's really important that we, um, have, have, that we collaborate. Um, a lot of times we have debates and people feel differently, very strongly. Uh, but it's important that we really are able to um, look at the data and, and consider what, what really is important um, and try to get rid of the politics. Uh, in the United States, we, we have these things called spaghetti westerns, right? You know, so you've heard of those. And it's like the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, you know, you have a clinical question, when can an athlete return to play? Um, you know, the good is leadership, collaboration, and connections. The bad is faulty science, misinformation and a lack of evidence, and the ugly is, is politics or confirmation bias. Uh, I'm, I'm from outside of Boston, so we say PISA instead of good, and we say wicked ugly. Uh, so, but um, you know, I think that the, there's a lot to be said for um, really trying to lead with um, collaboration. So um, some takeaways, the return to play decision and, and, and the process is complicated. I think it's important to listen and hear other perspectives. Um, collaborate. Everyone's trying to do their job with the shared goal of athlete health and safety. Um, and figure out what the common goals are, what the big picture is, what's, what's your end game, um, and again, what are the, know the knowledge gaps. And um, most importantly, look for options that might be able to modify risk and find a way to say yes, but only if that's what your patient wants and only if it's safe. So with that, I'll end. <laughs>